Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the podcast today, we have Jeffrey Klein. Jeffrey, welcome. Thanks, Thomas. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, sure. I prefer myself as the story guy because that's kind of the umbrella of everything that I do and believe. Uh, but I am a visual content producer, so I create I produce visual content, uh, which would be animation, video, graphics. I've got a team of very talented creatives that bring these things to life. Uh, I'm also an educator. I'm an adjunct professor, a TEDx speaker, and a podcaster myself. So there you go. Thank you for the introduction. Um, you did touch on something where, um, you know, the, the moment I saw your profile and saw you were a TEDx speaker, I was like, first thing I'm going to do is go immediately to the TEDx talk and watch that. Have you got any thoughts on watching it back now? It's, you know, it's an evolution in terms of my, my you know, so my TEDx was on the power of story and making sure you have one that matters to your audience. And the the journey is, a, um, it, it continues in terms of my kind of worldview about the best way to communicate with people and the effectiveness and the ways to do it. Um, but looking looking back at it, there are a couple of things that I'm, I'm happy about. One, the woman who ran the TEDx conference, uh, Lynn Gensler, Lynn Lisa, I really should get that right. Uh, she was awesome though, um, because she took what I had as a kind of, you know, idea. I'd done presentations and, and I kind of had a, a general idea of what I would do. And she basically said, are you open to making it better and I said yes and so she was a you know as a coach and, and again all the different TEDx conferences work differently but she took what I had which I thought was good and I think made it much much better uh the other thing that was I practiced a bunch and I was happy that the actual recording was a pretty good take of the ones I had done previously so it's nice when you're being recorded that uh I didn't I didn't stumble too much on that and the audience was was you know I think with any presentation, when you're giving a keynote and you have uh, an area where you're hoping someone laughs uh, and you get the laugh, then you're, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief and go, okay, I, I haven't, you know, not dead air crickets when, when you say something and you're hoping for a response, whatever it may be. Well, you get a laugh when you're not supposed to. That that has happened. Not in not, not the TEDx. I actually got a laugh um, in a place I wasn't expecting. Like, I... I, I was happy with it, but I hadn't thought it, it wasn't really a joke. It was just a term that people found, I think, interesting. Um, so yeah, the unexpected is always fun. Have you got any um, tips for others on if, let's say, someone was interested in doing a TEDx talk, what they should do and what your advice is? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, one of the things is being open to being a coach. You know, I, my, my mother's an executive coach. My wife is a coach. I'm surrounded by I have a coach uh, and I think we have to realize you know all these people on stage when you see a really good presenter you have to recognize that and you go oh my god they're a natural speaker they're really good they may have talent natural talent but they also work hard at it and the more hard work you put in the better it will be you know I say this to my kids you know you want to get good at something you got to practice it so uh, my advice is kind of uh, simple in terms of Whatever you're going to do, get comfortable with the material so that you can really own it, uh, practice lots, get feedback from others. Uh, and, and then specifically, if you're looking to do it, to, you know, you should have something that you feel is unique and, and powerful, that, a message you want to get out. Um, and I think, again, having passion for what you're talking about is really important because it comes across, you know, and I think people see that. When I talk about visual content, People see that I light up because I really am into it. When I talk about story and the power of it, I talk about it in a certain way because I really believe it. And so I think it's important in business and, and to, especially to, to believe what you're saying. Um, I think that it goes to one of my principles about telling stories, which is you have to be genuine. You know, authenticity is really important. Um, and then in terms of trying to do one, I have a friend who tried five or six times to do one uh and kept they kept saying no and she tried and she eventually got one and she did it um you know i was fortunate i applied for one and and i went through the process and was selected um but i think again if it's something you really want to do just keep there are lots of tedx conferences um 
And I think just, you know, keep clarifying and make sure you have the focus of what it is you want to say and why. Okay, thank you for that. You've touched upon content marketing. Um, I think people use, I don't know, certain terms in different ways. So what's content marketing to you? And um, what are some, some of the principles you like to apply to um, when you produce content marketing? For me, you know, content marketing is, is the most important thing you do as a, as a business when you're trying to attract and make people aware of what you do. But content marketing is, is sharing, if you're doing it right, is sharing relevant, valuable um, content that's going to resonate with a very specific audience that you're trying to reach. And so in terms of the strategy and tactics for doing it, it all goes down, and this is a, a principle I say about telling good stories, but it fits in with telling, you know, sharing good content, which is you have to start with what I call the 11th commandment. And the 11th commandment is know thy audience. So I think in the beginning of no, whenever you're thinking about the strategy for how you're going to market and in particular content, who are you trying to reach? Who's that audience? What do you know about them? What do they care about? Um, because if you try and create content and share it and you don't know your audience, you, you may not, you may be wasting your time. You may be just spinning your wheels because unless you know what's going to matter to them, they're not going to pay attention. Um, so I think the first principle is always to understand who you're trying to reach. A lot of people, when asked, you know, who's your audience, respond, well, I, anybody, everybody. And that may or may not be true, but I can tell you if that's the answer, it's going to be really hard and really expensive to start trying to reach the world. Um, so, it, and one of the beauties of digital marketing and social media marketing that's, is you can now target. You know, the audiences have already been segmented into these nice little groups for you. You just have to identify them and then reach out to them in that way. So I think, again, it's about understanding who your audience is, understanding that, you know, you may have a couple of different audiences, but you need to focus on one, create content that's going to resonate to them um, and, and start there. So, I mean, I think you may have touched upon my next question because um, when you do something on a daily basis, you tend to come across uh, regular misconceptions. So you may have just given me one anyway. But in addition to the one you just mentioned around, I produce content for everyone. What are the um, what are the misconceptions around content marketing? Uh, that has to be perfect. I think that's a misconception. Is like, oh, I shouldn't bother because uh, I I don't I can't afford to hire a production company, and using my iPhone isn't good enough. Um, I, I think again, being authentic is way more important than being polished. Um, so a lot of people don't start sharing because they want everything to look amazing. And you know, I think there's a threshold of, of quality that you want to reach. And there are times for certain kinds of content in terms of, you know, if you're going to have a brand video for your website, you might want to do that, hire someone to do that. But if you're doing a social media post, getting a tripod in your iPhone is okay. Um, and I think people paralyze themselves by you know the, the expression is you know that perfection is the enemy of the done uh, or the good and, and i believe that that a lot of people stop sharing because they're afraid it's not going to be good enough and so whether you call that imposter syndrome or, or just you know higher standards than, than it's realistic again i think as, as long as you're passionate and genuine about what it is you're sharing and you're being clear about what value you're bringing um then, then it doesn't it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, and related to that, I think is the fact that I started with know your audience. So a lot of misconceptions are that I think people share content and focus on how they're so great. Uh, um, you know, oh, our company won this award and we're the best at this and best at that. And I, I tell people, I said, unfortunately, people don't care about what you do. I'm like, what do you mean? That? I'm like, people don't care about what you do. They only care about what you can do for them. And so again, it all comes back to that audience piece, which is making sure that whatever value you're giving to someone, they want or need, or maybe they don't know it. But you know, and so I, I when I create my content, I'm always talking about what I'm trying to create is edutainment. So it's you know, some value you're gonna learn something, and you're gonna maybe hopefully smile you know that's that's my my goal when i share you know i'm doing these um 
Instagram reels at the moment. I'm sharing stats and things about the power of visual or I'm sharing little cute animations. And the idea is that I'm giving you something that hopefully will make you think and, and learn something, but doing it in a way that's, you know, easy on the eyes, as it were. Well, you touched upon standards and um, I wanted to ask you about, I think in your profile, you mentioned working on major motion pictures at Paramount and MGM. I would imagine there's some good stories there. So have you got anything to share at all? Uh, I signed lots of non-disclosure agreements, but I'll share a few a few things. I'll share a story that... Uh, I was going to say, that's an end to that conversation then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I haven't done... I've been in the business for a long time. And uh, I, I'm not... My fear of retribution is just not not there. So um, I worked on a lot of different movies. And, and I think, you know, there's an element of the studio system, which I worked in, where there are a lot of cooks in that kitchen. And I'll share the story that I find really fascinating. So, you know, I worked in a talent agency in the story department where I read lots of scripts and I read a lot of bad scripts. And then when I worked at Paramount, you know, one of the, I worked for the head of production. And so every script that was considered for purchase came into our office. Now these scripts have already made it through the funnel. So they have an agent, you know, and, and I think people don't recognize it. The, percent, the likelihood of getting a movie made, let alone sold, is so small um, because you have to get through a lot of gatekeepers to actually get it to the hands of the studio where they go, okay, let me read to the producer. To, you have to get to an agent and then usually a producer and then to the studio itself. And everyone has to be willing to kind of put it forward. But as soon as the script is purchased by a studio, 90% of the time, what's the first thing the studio does? They rewrite it. So I've seen scripts that have had bidding wars to buy. And literally the first thing they do is they do a new draft. So even if it's the writer themselves that sold it, because it could be a new writer where I can understand maybe they are. But even if it's a known writer, when they do the deal to buy the script, the deal almost always includes another draft before they have even started. So, you know, we people are critical of movies and they go, oh my God, well, sometimes part of the challenge of having a script that's coherent is you've had, and if you look at the credits, you'll say, you know, John and Mary worked on it and then Steve and Bob worked on it and then, oh, Joey worked on it and the story's by this other guy. And so it's it's hard, I think, to sometimes, and I, and I, and I give a lot of credit to the producers and the studio executives to try and keep it on, on focused um, and, and make the best, you know, piece of content they can. Um, my boss, I, I was really fortunate when I worked at Paramount, uh, my boss had gone to film school, had actually directed a movie, which is very rare for executives. Um, and so she understood and was always really focused on making the best story. I mean, she really was from that. And, and sometimes she, had challenges because of all those cooks in the kitchen and budgets and schedules. Cause you have, you know, uh, there was a, a unit production manager, the guy, basically the producer was on set and he get, he talked, he was talking to a group of us and he said, let me tell you the difference between an artist and a craftsman. And I love this description. He said, an artist is someone who just goes and paints whatever they want, wherever they want, whatever medium, thanks for playing. And so they have no boundaries whereas a craftsman has parameters. So even Michelangelo, when he did the Sistine Chapel, he only had so much distance between that wall and that wall and this wall and this wall. And by having those parameters, he had to craft something and he was actually being hired to do it. So he had to make sure that there was someone else that he was doing it for. So unlike an artist who, you know, true artist who can just, it's their, you know, spirit. Anyone who works in marketing, production, you know, is doing it within parameters of budget, time, other people's commerciality. You know, trying to make a movie that's going to make money is, as well as making a good movie, are two different things. And I worked on a movie where I think uh, it was a sequel. And I think it was going so great for a variety of reasons. And they just threw money at it. You know, more explosions or more of this. And, um, and until they got it good enough. And it, and it came out fine. And, and I think, again, one of the producers stepped in to really help make it that way. Um, 
I'll tell you one last story that I love, which is, so I had a friend who is a, an AD and assistant director, and he worked on a big uh, budget movie. Uh, and I forget the name of the director, which I probably shouldn't use anyway, but they're in, they're in a huge sound stage with, you know, that, like it had a tank and it was because it was on the water and, and, and the, the director's like up on a platform and has a, a bullhorn. And so it's the beginning of the day and he gets on the bullhorn and he says, let's see how we can spend $250,000 today. And that was his, you know, rallying cry to the people below. Um, and I think it was a, a good way of being like, listen, we're spending a lot of money here. Let's get it right. Let's have fun. Let's do it right. Um, so that's, uh, you know, my experience. Um, there are a lot of other stories that I, I could share and some I can't share. So there you go. Well, um, for whatever reason, um, I didn't put two and two together about the fact that, you know, you'd be influenced um, by, I don't know, the, the movie industry or because the power of story, I was looking at it through the lens of content marketing. But have you ever um, tried your hand at uh, creating a script yourself? Uh, unfortunately, I've written several. And what, what I would tell you about the writing process. So I've written probably five or six scripts over the years. Um, and they're all mediocre. And so, uh, admittedly, you know, so I read lots of bad scripts and mine's not as bad as some and it's definitely not as good as others. And I think the challenge with writing and I'm working on writing books. So I, I'm in the thick of it at the moment, which is for some writing is not the hard part and it's not really what makes a piece of content good from when you're, I think when you're doing narrative work, it's the rewrite. It's the editing. So I always like to say that I'm a writer in search of an editor. Um, and so it's the scripts I, I had, and it's interesting that the genre of scripts that I wrote when I was in my early twenties, I wrote these kind of gritty, you know, and it wasn't really me, but I thought, Oh, I, this is kind of the thing I need to write about. And then I eventually wrote a kind of romantic comedy and I was like, okay, this is getting closer to what I need to do. Uh, and then the years what happened. So, I'm getting ready to write my, what was then my next and last script. And I had a friend I worked with at Paramount. And while I was working there, he sold a script. I'm like, the dream, he's done it. Um, and that was, you know, 20 plus years ago. And guess what's going on with that script? Nothing. <laughs> it, just because you sell it doesn't, and he, you know, he didn't make enough money to then quit his job. You know, he was a first time writer, you know, you get scale. So he might have made 50 grand, a lot of money, but again, not life changing. That's going to make you. And he ended up uh, kind of leaving Hollywood to work in a different in marketing, actually. Um, but I caught up with him and he said to me, yeah, I said, what, what, you know, I was kind of asking him about his writing. And he said, yeah, I actually went, I had an interest in writing novels. And so he got, he wrote a novel. He got a book agent at a major agency. You're like, oh my God, you know, that itself is an accomplishment. It went to all the major pushing houses and almost got bought. But the difference between the script that actually got bought and the novel that he wrote was that he could then take that novel and publish it. And it was right when self-publishing became a little more um, acceptable and known. So that's what he did. And the book was out there and I, it was the first book I read on my Kindle um, and I loved it. And I was like, so, and he wrote another one and he didn't even try and get a book. He just went straight to self-publishing. And so it's, it's one of those things where uh, nowadays there are a lot of avenues for people who want to write uh, beyond the traditional system and the studio system being one, you know, independent film being another. Um, and I love that you can now, you know, cause at a minimum he's going to have it. I friends of his can read it, his family can read it. Um, and so it's it's out there. So I ended up writing that would be next script as a novel. And then in the middle of, well, as I started to write it, um, my wife got pregnant with twins and I've been a little distracted since then. So Why would you be distracted and, with that? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually now focused on writing a business book and then one day I'll get back to my novel. Or as I like to call it, my novella, because I don't think it would be long enough to be technically a novel. Well, um, you did touch upon something. When you said, um, what's the first thing that happens when um, someone buys a script? My actual answer was going to be, it goes and sits in a drawer for a year or two before anyone does anything with it. But... 
that that is also the case. I'll tell you, um, there was a, a script based on a story, or there was a project. So when they call what happens, when that happens, when it goes on a shelf, they call it development hell. So basically everything from the moment a script is purchased until it goes into production is development. So it might be, it's basically rewriting the script and, you know, working on it and notes and then, um, but there was, I remember we used to have all the scripts on the shelves to the right of us kind of looking and, the, and some of them like, what's, what's with this, you know, this project has been there and it had been there for years. <laughs> And subsequent to me leaving, it, it did eventually get made. And there was, there was two that I remember. I, I'm pretty, and I actually think one got made at a different studio, because what ends up happening is someone buys the rights to a book, they develop it, and then nothing happens. The rights revert back to the writer or back to the other studio, and so another studio will buy it. Um, but I'm pretty sure the curious case of Benjamin Button had been in development for years. Um, before it actually got made. And there's lots of stories of, of, of movies that had been in the development for a long time um, before they actually got made, so got the green light. I mean, that's that's the big, you know, people say, oh, has the movie been greenlit? Greenlit means they're going to make it. Um, and so, yes, uh, you are right that the first thing that happens often is that it goes in a pile. Um, but the first thing that actively happens to it is that they rewrite it. Well, um, there's something which um, maybe you have covered, but again, um, if you've got anything in addition to add, it would be good because I think it's a nice little, if anyone was going to ask you about something on your profile, I think this would be it. And it is tips or tools to help people implement immediately to improve their communication. What does that mean to you? Right. Uh, so when I meet with people and they know that I'm a content producer and I do visual content. Um, they often, and I tell them about the power of story. They're like, well, what can I do to tell a better story? What can I do to create better content? And there are a couple of tips that I give right off the bat that I think, you know, the, the, that overarching, you know, 11th commandment, find out more about your audience before you start to spend time and energy creating stuff. Um, that time will be well spent. Um, so that's the first thing is like, do you know who your audience is? Because a lot of businesses that are marketing, when you ask them who's your audience, don't have a clear answer. <laughs> so there are tools like, a, you know, you can do a, a customer avatar um, where you basically create an ideal client and you actually make a character out of them where, you know, you'll say it's, you know, Susie, you know, Susie marketer. And so what does Susie do? She works at a marketing company and she's looking. And, and so there's, a, if you look up, you know, buyer persona template, there are lots of them online. If anyone wants to reach out to me, I have one I can share. And it's giving a template, uh, a snapshot of who you're trying to market to. And so then when you're thinking about creating content, you want to filter it through what will this persona, will that resonate with them? Because you, you have to put it through that lens. So I think that's something people can do right away is like get clear of your audiences. Then it's about, okay, well, now what? And so I try and tell people that when you are creating content, you want to keep it simple. And simple is usually structure. So good old Aristotle back in 350 BC came up with this great thing called the three-act structure. Talking about movies, it's you know what everyone talks about, you know, the arc, the journey of the hero's journey. There are lots, but every story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I, I believe unless you're uh, a maverick, you know, filmmaker, which are very few, people stick to that structure, one to, you know, beginning, middle, and end. Um, in business, I, I agree. And I, I have crafted uh, what I call a tool called the story pad, the P-A-D. And the P-A-D, the pad, represents the beginning, middle, and end of your story. And this is a tool I, I share with people. And it's really simple. So what is the beginning of your story? And we, you know, if you think about the audience, the P stands for the pain or problem of your audience, of your customer. You start there. Because in this world of infobesity, which is information overload. We're bombarded all the time with too much information. One of the ways you cut through is by making sure that whatever it is you're sharing is going to grab the attention of that person. Now, telling a story immediately is going to help that because of the way that you have a rising cortisol, certain hormones are going to help you be alert. But also speaking to their problem, to their pain, they're going to you know, perk up. Oh, wait, I have that problem. You know, 
And it can be something as silly as, you know, are you hungry? And you're like, oh, actually, I am hungry. You know, or you're looking for a good meal. Yeah, I, I, I'm a foodie. So starting with the pain or, or the interest of what that person is. And then the A is the answer. So you have the problem and the answer. And the answer is your product or service. So I'm hungry. Don't worry. We have a new restaurant opening up. It's got fabulous food. Come and have a look. That's where a lot of people stop. You know, there's a problem. Here's the answer. Okay, that's a good story, right? But the D in PAD is actually pretty important. And I think a lot of businesses fail to incorporate that. So you have the problem and the answer. So I'm hungry. And, you know, Thomas's uh, Bistro is available to serve you delicious food. The D stands for the difference that it makes in that person's business or life. What I refer to as the impact. So yes, you're hungry. You come to Thomas's Bistro and have a fabulous meal. And the result of that is that you will have a wonderful dining experience and be, you know, or impress your friends. You know, it can be a couple of different things, but you want people to understand how, why it matters. You know, because they could get food from lots of different places, but they're coming to your food. You have the answer. You actually have the sustenance. And this particular is gonna, the way the whole experience is something that's going to impress your friends or make you feel good. All those things are going to give them a good reason for why they should pick your bistro over somewhere else. So that's a tool that I've, I've shared with people. It keeps it really simple. The PAD, the story pad, problem, answer, difference. Sounds like a more positive um, version of um problem agitate solution have you heard that one i heard a couple yeah so the story pad is not in itself a unique uh formula it's my version to try and make it easy to remember there are a couple different versions of it and in the same way that certain people argue there's only seven different stories that you can tell you know there's no such thing as a truly original story um and i think again it's about how you apply it um but the story pad is definitely about starting, you know, I think you look at case studies, well, what was the situation? And other people have situation, you know, resolution. And so there's, there's a couple different ways. I've tried to narrow it down in a way that made sense to me. That's easy to remember story pad. Um, of course, what I often find is people go, okay, story pad, problem, answer. What was the D again? <laughs> the difference. What difference does it make? Um, so I sometimes have to hone that home, but, uh, yeah, it's not, again, I, I'm not I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm trying to serve a tool that people can easily use fill in the blanks to make their business story more compelling. Um, and people, people... Well, I would add it's, it is a more positive <laughs> wheel. I like the positive side of I, the wheel. I, you know, I would choose that Well, one. Thomas, I believe uh, one of my kind of missions in life is that there's enough negativity in the world. I don't want to add any more. So I do, I am, you know, I, uh, optimist about life and people. And so, yes, positivity is something that I, I do believe in. You mentioned the, the story types. Um, and I was going to ask you about where, what your thoughts are on that and whether you use that when you, I don't know, tell a story, for example, um, any, any thoughts there? Anti-hero, I think is one of them. Yeah, my kind of default, and I'll probably include this in my book. Uh, and it was in my in my TED talk, but is about um, the shapes of stories. So Kurt Vonnegut, in his failed uh, anthropology dissertation, came up with this idea, and it's a visual thing. But I'll try and kind of you know, if you think about a, a, a x-axis and a, a y-axis and an x-axis, every story can be plotted on this. And so the the y-axis going up and down is at the top you have good fortune, at the bottom you have misfortune. And on the left of the x-axis, you have the beginning, and on the right, you have the end. And so every story begins with someone who's either doing really well or doing really poorly, somewhere on that spectrum. And then something needs to change, because what makes a good story is conflict. Without conflict, you got a pretty boring story. Thomas was doing well. Thomas continues to do well. Thomas always does well. Who cares? Like, no drama. We need drama. So Thomas is doing well. Oh, no, then he has a disaster. But don't worry, Thomas finds a way to overcome it and then ends up being the hero. Uh, so there's, you know, and that shape in particular, which he refers to as man in a hole, is a really good shape and story for businesses. You start with someone who's doing okay, or maybe they're starting poorly, but they're doing okay, and then they get the problem. It's like, oh, my God, 
I've lost all my money. I've gone into bankruptcy. Don't worry, our firm can help you get your money back on track. And then you end up even better than where you started. And that structure of a story is kind of fits perfectly with the story path. You know, you have a problem, then we have a solution. And the difference is that life is great. Um, there are other stories that, you know, people, in terms of compelling stories, you have the, you know, rags to riches. That's kind of a little bit like that. Um, you have the downfall where someone's doing really well and then all of a sudden they slump down, you know? So there's, um, so yeah, I think there are only a certain number of places you can start, you know, you can either be in a good place, a neutral place, a spectrum of good or a spectrum of bad. Like, so there's, there's not infinite possibilities of what condition someone could be in. in. And there's only a certain amount of, of times that you can end in that position, you know, the story where you end, where you end a story is often critical. You know, you know, you, you stop the story a few minutes before, and you know, all of a sudden, the person doesn't save the day. Um, and then within that period, you want to have ups and downs. Um, Pixar is wonderful at doing this, and I, I was fortunate enough to hear one of the writers from Toy Story and and uh, Up and, and and one of them talk about if you follow along there's a structure within the movies that goes up and then something down happens. And those movies keep us emotionally engaged because we connect with the, the characters, we connect with the, the, the heroes, and then we're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah. And so we're following along uh, that conflict and that contrast is what's important to make a compelling story. Great explanation. Um, the, I wanted to ask you about, because this is in your TED talk as well, the interest-based value. Um, do you mind just giving a definition of that? I feel like you have touched on it, um, but at the same time, um, I think for the sake of the audience, I think it's worth exploring. Yeah, so you can give someone value. You can provide value in your content, you know? Um, but if I'm not the right audience, if I'm not interested in that value, then there's a disconnect. So the interest-based value has to be value that I, I want. So rather than just something that's you know useful, it has to be useful to me. And so the interest is understanding, again, it's a connection between knowing your audience and then providing them with value for that audience, for their problems and their pain. So interest-based value is really about understanding what it is that you want to communicate that's going to have impact to that audience, to that specific audience. Because a lot of times we'll say, well, I, I gave value. I told them about how important it is to brush your teeth. And they're like, yes, but you're doing it to a bunch of dentists who already know how important it is to brush your teeth. So that's out of interest to them. Whereas if it's people who like to eat candy, they're like, well, I eat a lot of candy. I need to make sure I take care of my teeth. Don't worry, we have this, med you know. So it really depends on that interest of the individual person of the audience that you're fulfilling that interest that you're giving value based on that need or that interest they have do you mind um just clarifying what your goals are what you're trying to achieve at the moment at the moment it, it changes day to day right now i'm just trying to get through the week because it's my twin daughter's 16th birthday so survival is always a goal um but i, I I'm always trying to help people communicate better. Those are that's my kind of mission in life. So I, when people say, "What's your mission?" It's to tell and share awesome stories and help others tell and share awesome stories. Right now, I'm trying to help people do that. My goal is to help people do that more with a very specific medium. So animation is the kind of general area that I'm I'm spending a lot of time in producing. I really enjoy the process. I think that. The output is really powerful. It stands out, which is something you want to do in marketing. And then recently, I'm really starting to focus on doing uh, more 3D animation. Um, so we talked about Pixar earlier. Um, there's something about 3D that's really immersive and, and the ability to show things that are, have an element of realism to them and the depth to them uh, that I find really compelling. And I think most of the reason that people don't consider 3D animation is they think it's way too expensive um, and therefore they're, they're turned off. And so I'm actually doing something a little crazy at the moment, which is I'm offering 3D animation at 2D animation pricing because I'm just that committed to wanting to create it. Now, 
we won't be making Toy Story 5 uh, in our little animated videos, especially not in 30 seconds. But we're, we're, we, uh, my team is, is capable now, and I, I basically have evolved my team over time to really um, create some stunning you know, Pixar-like uh, animations. I'm working on a promo right now, and, and I'm, I'm surprised more people have not been engaged. I had someone who were doing a 2D animation for and I said, you can do this in 3D. And they were like, well, um, I feel like it's overkill. And I think part of it is that it's a little animation that's going at the front end of live video. And I, he's a little concerned that if they really like the 3D animation, they may be like, wait, why did we go to, to live? Let's carry on. Um, but it's not in the perfect solution for every industry. Although I think, uh, you know, obviously if you have a physical product you want to showcase, 3D is really wonderful at being able to see it from lots of different angles and pull it apart and do things that you can't do. Um, we've done medical animations, which are a little creepy, but kind of cool when you can go and see uh, your brain bleeding and you can actually see what it looks like. Um, but even, you know, in the character animation uh, that you can do, where you have a spokesperson talk about um, your product or service explaining it, uh, can be really compelling. Uh, but for me, visual content is always the goal, is to get more people embracing that power because it's been proven over and over again that visual content is much more impactful in terms of getting people to connect with your content. So if you want people to understand what you do more, visual content will help you. If you want people to under to remember what you do, visual content. And again, I start with story. So when people say, what are you focused on? Visual storytelling, that's my jam. Um, and so it's, it's one of the, my goal is that I will um, continue to do it. You know, I, I keep finding it's, you know, and then separately, my goal is to write this book. So you talk about, I'm throwing it out there. I have, I have, um, I'm, I'm looking at different people to, to who are going to help, help me write it. I do like to write. Um, so it's one of those things that I, but I, time is always, you know, a challenge. Um, and I, I have, I have what a lot of marketers have, which is um, shiny, shiny object syndrome. <laughs> so I'm like, oh wait, this looks, this looks fun over here. Let me let me go and focus on that. And oh wait, no. And and so you know, it's got to keep discipline is something that's really important for entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think it's a challenge because it's in the face of innovation. You want to you know you want to focus on what you're working and developing something, and it's you want to then go and do something new. And in terms of my writing, so you asked about my screenwriting. I, I would finish a script and then I would have a choice. I could either back and work hard on this thing that I just, you know, finished, or I could start on this new idea that I really like. And often, so more often than I'd be like, yeah, that's going to be too much like hard work. Let me start new and then start with something that's, you know, I can just create from scratch. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, my goal is to be less distracted. Well, you made a public commitment now, so. It's much more likely to happen, right? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. So um, there's a Harvard business study that was relayed to me, and I heard this from a couple people, but there's a CEO who was speaking at a networking event and said, according to Harvard Business, if you write down your goals, you're 90% more likely to achieve them. And so after that meeting, I wrote a note to the CEO, and I said, dear sir, per your you know recommendation in Harvard Business, I'm writing to you to share with you my goals. My goal is to have you as a client. My goal is to help create content for you. And my goal is to help have a content type impact or something. So, and um, we ended up getting a meeting with him. I don't know if that hand delivered note helped, uh, but it took two years. And I was actually at different, my own company now, uh, maybe even two and a half years. And they're, they're now a client who I've been working with for 18 months. So there you go. <laughs> I wrote it down and, it, and it, you know, there's all that manifestation things and laws of attraction that I believe in a bit. Um, and sometimes it's just about smart luck, another concept that I may or may not try and squeeze into my book. So dumb luck is you're walking down the street and there's five quid. So yeah, I'm trying to speak to my audience now. Um, and so you pick it up and you stick it in your pocket, that's smart luck. I mean, that's a dumb luck. Smart luck is you wanna act, Take some acting classes. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> put yourself in position to be successful. Um, and so I think that's something that we all have to remember that if you, you know, it's that work, you know, 
whether it's there are lots of variations. It's the you know Malcolm Gladwell's ten thousand hours. You know practice makes perfect. Um, Michael Jordan, I think, shot you know a thousand shots a day. Um, the people who are successful, we often don't see a lot of the hard work that comes in before they pop. Um, and you have to really you know success for most does not come at the click of fingers. It comes from caring a lot and working really hard. Yeah, I um I sort of refer to that as like cause and effect. So and the the comedic thing that I would add there is like yes, Michael Jordan did um write down his goals, but at the same time he was also doing a thousand shots a day uh, which which is the cause which produces the effect, right? But um and yours your example is the persistence of two years of trying to get a client is uh <laughs> is why you got that client but that's just my opinion yeah i think persistence and intention that's the other thing is i think is really important so a lot of when i would you know talk about the film industry i wanted to work in the film industry i didn't know anyone in the film industry and people like i people like what do you want to do i'm like i want to go work in the film industry and their the response is oh that's hard and i'm like a lot of things are hard but i'm going to go do it and i think there's a group of people that i refer to as the naysayers that you know, oh, how are you gonna, how's that? Oh, that sounds, you know, oh no, you can't, you know, the can't people. Um, and my response to that is that, you know, you have to have conviction about your intentions and speak it. And so again, that writing it down. So when people would, I would say to people, you know, I wanna work in the film industry. Some people said, oh, I know some of the film industry. I would say, who, can you introduce me? You know, it would, it would be, and then I would take the name and the follow-up part of a lot of this. So that pers persistence, I've gotten a lot of things in my life by sheer persistence, including um, the love of my life, who at one point I think I, I might have, I was, I was, I was courting her. Uh, we've been married now 18, 18 years. Um, and my friend who our mutual friend was like, dude, she likes you, but you need to chill out. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay. So I didn't call her for a few days. And then apparently she told her friend like, why hasn't he called? So I can't wait. Um, but it worked out uh, in the end, and, and I, I found that balance between, you know, there's a balance, I think, in sales as well, like what's the frequency in terms of the, the being persistent and then crossing over to being annoying. And I think um, it's there's an art to it um, that people have to recognize that balance. Um, but I do like what's something that I've picked up recently, which is when you're trying to achieve something, whether, you know, I look at this, I've been doing this with, you know, podcast guests, um, but anything I think, and you're trying to get someone to do something that persistence means keeping going until they say no, at least once, you know? So if you're asking someone for something and they don't say no, then the door is still open, you know? And I think we need to, if they say, you know, they're at some point they're gonna be like, not interested, go away. You have to respect that and, you know, some people say that a no really just means not now or not yet. Um, I think, again, you have to balance being persistent with being overbearing. Well, we kind of went down the, uh, the self-development route down the end there. So um, thanks for that, adding that at the end. Um, have you got anything that, you, um, that you'd like to share, which I haven't asked you about today? Uh, I guess, you know, you, you, uh, so I have a podcast and one, someone recently said to me, um, it, are you mentioning it when you're getting interviewed? And I'm like, no, I'm on their podcast. Why would I mention my podcast? So uh, I, I'm pretty proud of my podcast and partly because of the persistence I've had in the guests I've gotten. So I'm in my fifth season and this season, they usually have themes and this season is what I call the season of champions. So if you have the name champion in your title, then you're a good guest for me. Uh, so, so far I've recorded and I've released uh, episode, there are nine episodes and four are out. One is a world back end champion. One just won, um, was the champion of a Netflix show called Blown Away, which is glass blowing. He's always a glass blowing champion. I had a master chef champion, uh, Chef Geron, who's awesome. And then literally yesterday, the fourth episode, which was, an American Ninja Warrior champion, the first, Isaac Caldieri, who was the first one to climb the mountain and win the million dollars. Uh, actually, he wasn't the first to climb the mountain. He was the first one to win the million dollars because uh, there's a little controversy because someone else 
went before him and completed it, but he had a better time. So he was the champion. I think that's, that's still qualifies as the champion he's a great guy and so so um yeah it's it's something it's it's pretty easy to find you know it's called connect the dots uh but my company is called nine dots so if you go to nine dots podcast.com that'll get you to uh, see all those awesome episodes well the last question is um where's the best place for people to find you so other than the podcast anywhere else you're active uh, pretty active on LinkedIn. If people want to reach out to me, Instagram. Uh, I'm pretty active on uh, most of my social is GG Klein. So on Instagram, it's GG Klein, um, uh, and then Nine Dots Media is the other one. So Instagram, Nine Dots Media, or GG Klein, and you'll get most of the. Uh, and then Nine Dots Media com is my visual content agency, and then GG Klein com is my speaking platform. So those are the easiest ways to reach me. Gigi Klein does sound like you're some sort of fashion guru, though. Is this the case? <laughs> it's my name. I can't. <laughs> Gigi, that's what people, you know, people who know me affectionately call me Gigi. It's my first and middle initials. So, cool. <laughs> well, go. thank you. For but I would not be able to today. give much fashion advice there. Uh, I've enjoyed it, is what I was going to say. And thank you for all the, uh, the information that you shared. Thomas, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>